You're listening to Bad Dog Agility, bringing you training tips, interviews, and news about the great sport of dog agility. And now, here are your hosts, Sarah and Esteban. I'm Esteban. And I'm Sarah, and this is episode 159. Today's podcast is brought to you by Elite Science. Unlock your dog's full potential with a unique competitive edge solution, 1TDC. One tetradecanol complex is a patented blend of unique fatty acid oils designed to safely and effectively keep joints and muscles at their best to maximize performance and shorten recovery time. One TDC is the next generation of fatty acids beyond glucosamine and fish oil and is used by many current and past national agility champions and world team members. Bad Dog Agility listeners will automatically qualify for a great 1TDC special offer by purchasing online at bda1tdc.com. That's bda1tdc.com. Today's podcast is also brought to you by Back on Track. Dog agility is a demanding sport and can be difficult on the body, both the dogs and the humans. Back on Track specializes in dog blankets, beds, and wraps that keep muscles warm and reduce the pain in joints. If you've got a nagging knee, calf, or ankle injury, Back on Track's human products can help get you back in the ring. Visit Back on Track at BackOnTrackProducts.com. Today, we're going to be talking about muscle memory for the agility handler. That's right. And I always like to start with Wikipedia because I hear everything in there is accurate. 100%. Anyway, Wikipedia says that muscle memory has been used synonymously with motor learning, which is a form of procedural memory that involves consolidating a specific motor task into memory through repetition. Did, did that make sense to anyone else? I think let's let's put it in easier words. Okay, so what does that really mean? Well, any motor task, and first, let's think about some motor tasks. What are some examples of motor tasks? I'll start. I'll start. Riding a bicycle. You go. Oh, I was going to do agility stuff. We're, t- we're doing stuff outside of agility. Okay, let me think. Let me think. Shooting a basketball. Uh, good one. Okay. Flossing your teeth. Typing on a keyboard. Playing the piano. I'm out. <laughs> All right. Well, in any case, what it means is the first time you do anything, okay, whether it's playing the piano or the first time you sent a text message on your brand new smartphone all those years ago and you were typing it out with your little fingers, the process was slow. Your fingers were a little stiff. You made mistakes. And with practice, that improved. You know, it's not always that way. That's just how it starts. You're going to get smoother. Your fingers get less stiff. Uh, when you're riding a bicycle, you look less awkward. And you have to think about it less. That's right. So have you ever watched a top handler on the agility course and thought, wow, they look so smooth, right? They look practiced. How fast can you type in the code to your phone right now to unlock it? extremely fast. Right? My seven-year-old can type it out extremely fast. Right. In less than a second, she right. can type it out. Yep. And so when you're at a gas station, right, and you put in your credit card and you're pumping gas and it prompts you for your zip code, how automatic is that? Sometimes I don't even realize that I've already typed it in. And I reach down to type it in. Oh, I've already done it. I can go put the nozzle in, in the car. Here, here's a great example, actually, of of really muscle memory and the fact that it is subconscious, automatic, something that you do without thinking. Have you ever had to tell somebody your password that you normally type and you couldn't tell them what it was without putting your hands on a keyboard and kind of fake typing it because it's something that's so built into your muscle memory that you aren't actually reciting or thinking about the letters. That is a great example. That Especially a- these really awkward passwords that sometimes you're given and have to keep, you know, we have like number corporate, signs yeah, and corporate numbers settings in there. and stuff like that. Yeah. Sure, sure. Uh, those are great examples. And the whole point is with these motor skills, uh, these gross motor skills, we call them, there's a lot of conscious thought and effort at first, but with repetition, and I'm talking about a lot of repetitions. It becomes an unconscious process. You do it without thinking. So why is muscle memory so important to the sport of agility? And I'm telling you, it is critically important and a major part of the success that we've had uh, in agility and that all people have. And and just I think a lot of people aren't aware of it. Uh, Well, it helps you as a human being 
function at maximum efficiency. Think about it now. Attention is a very valuable and limited thing. Okay. If you're a babysitter and you're watching one kid, all right. You know, that takes a certain amount of attention. Now you're watching five kids. Your attention is split among these five kids. Now you're watching 50 kids and you're the only one. I would argue that you might not have the enough attention to spread out among 50 children. So if I'm paying attention, another example here, if I'm paying attention to the football game, right? And that means I'm going to be paying less attention to the question my seven-year-old daughter is asking me. All right. And when you, Sarah, find her in her bedroom eating a ton of candy, she's going to say, well, daddy said yes. <laughs> right. Okay. Because my attention was split. It was mostly on the football game. So let's apply this. Let's take this back to agility. Now, if I'm doing a front cross and I have to pay a lot of attention because I'm kind of new or a beginner to what my feet are doing, what my arms are doing, I have less attention available for focusing on the next part of the course. This is why you see lots of beginners get lost when they execute certain moves. They're thinking so hard about the move they're doing, they lose sight of what's next on the course. Or they're not watching their dog, so they lose that connection with the dog. They're not able to reconnect and the dog goes off course. So that's a great example where if my front cross footwork and arm position and execution, if those mechanical motor skills are now unconscious, now I freed up all this attention that I can now devote to another aspect of agility. And this is why it's so important. That's right. And, and this is, this is the reason why I wanted to talk about this topic, because I think that we can all take pieces of agility and make them more automatic, more smooth, more fluent for us as the handler. We can all do that. But when you've been in the sport for a while, you know that that's the process that you're going through. Even if you haven't articulated it that way, even if you haven't thought about it this way, you know that it gets easier with time, right? But when you have a brand new competitor running an agility for the first time with their dog, they don't necessarily know that there is a path where it's not going to be as hard as it is today for them. I think there are some beginning handlers that are going to think, I am just not cut out for the sport. Mm -hmm. I can't do this as the handler. It's too awkward for me. You know, it. They think every, they don't have the talent, the coordination, exactly. that they're physically different from other people. And what I want these very beginning people to know is that I promise you, promise you, promise you that it gets easier. I promise you that it gets more automatic. I promise you that you will not always have to think so hard about every step that you're taking, every footfall that you make, that you can't have attention for the rest of the course. I promise you that that phase will this, pass. This, these are a lot of promises you're making. And if you could promise to help me with the uh, dishes and laundry a little bit later today. <laughs> you know? I promise to help you with the dishes and the laundry later today. <clears throat> we'll see about that. It's on tape. All right. Now, now we've convinced you that muscle memory is important. And so you're wondering, well, how do I get that great muscle memory you're talking about? Well, this is where you go back to that fancy Wikipedia definition. And it's right there in the definition. You're consolidating a specific task into your memory through repetition. A.K.A. Practice. That's right. Okay, that means practicing. If you're going to train with me, me, Esteban specifically, you're going to practice a lot. How many of you out there go to a weekly class or you go to a seminar and you get in five or ten minutes of actual time on a course? right? How many front crosses are you actually doing on that course? Even if you get to run it two, three, four times and say there's two, three, four front crosses, what is that? 12? So maybe 12 front crosses. I went to the gym yesterday morning just to shoot baskets. I'm not a professional basketball player. I don't even play in a league with referees. I just play the occasional pickup game on Sunday. I went out there to shoot baskets and practice and put up a bunch of threes. And I took, um, I took over a hundred three point shots. You're doing 12 front crosses. I'm taking a hundred three point shots. Think about that. Muscle memory. I'm going to have it. After 12 repetitions, you are not going to have it. Think about how many times you had to type in your code to unlock your phone for that to be absolute muscle memory. How much muscle memory is involved when you write a check and then it changes to January 1st and now you write the wrong year? <laughs> it's true. 
right? You've been writing checks all year, not just on your checks. You've been signing documents. You've been filling out healthcare paperwork when you go to the doctors, for paperwork for your kids, registration stuff for your dog, dog show entries. How many times have you typed in 2016, but now it's 2017? Not 12, much more than that. So I think people are really underestimating the amount of repetitions that you need to do something. Okay. And so this dedication to practice is a, is a serious con. If you look at the pros and cons, it's a con for a lot of people. And a lot of people are going to give you the argument that it's just not good for the dog. Hey, I've got great news for you. <laughs> you just stepped right? right into his trap. No, that's right. That's right. But let, before I get there, before I get there, they're not used to the idea of dog agility as a sport, a true sport. They're not familiar with the concept of dog training as a mechanical skill that can be improved with practice. They don't want to do handling maneuvers without the dog because it doesn't seem real to them. It doesn't feel real if the dog's not doing it with them, right? Basketball players spend only a fraction of their practice time playing five on five with a ref and a whistle and going at it in those real game situations. Most of the time they're doing stuff, they're doing stuff as skill work, right? Three on three, one on one, one on none, just them and an assistant trainer putting up shots, working on their mechanics. And so a lot of their practice is even done without a basketball. Mind-boggling, right? Think about it. And so now we get to my number one tip for everybody listening here. And it's to practice without the dog. And people, and and I'm telling you that people don't like to do this. Okay, but if you are willing to do this, you are going to get better. And you are going to get better so much faster than the next person. It's crazy because that person is going to be doing 12 not great repetitions of front crosses with their dog. The first couple will be bad. The next couple will be better. The last couple might be good. You're going to do like 50 of them in just two or three minutes. And your first 10 are going to be awful. Your next 20 are going to be better. Your last 20 are going to be great. And the first 12 times you do it with your dog are going to be very, very good and better than theirs. And you're going to have a a history there, five times better than theirs. And you're going to have more attention available for other stuff they're not going to have. And you're saving you're saving the physical work for your dog. And guess what? The amount of work is the same for the dog. Yeah. The dogs in general are getting rewarded more because there's less mistakes because you're better, right? So this is win-win. It's a win for you, and it's a great win for your dog. And so don't do it for you. Now is your chance to suck it up and get the extra work in and suffer a little bit and sweat a little more and be a little more tired to really preserve your dog. That's the way I think about it, especially when I'm doing new stuff. I remember when I was first teaching the threadle to my border collie, Rook, getting her ready for trials years and years ago. And, you know, that international handling, that was at a level, quite honestly, it was beyond us. I couldn't even execute a, a good threadle in any way, shape or form. But I went out there and I practiced and I practiced and I practiced. All without the dog until it felt fluid to me. And then I would go and try it with her and we would still make mistakes. But imagine if I had done all those repetitions so horribly with her, how demotivating it would have been to have repetition after rep after rep, no reward. You know, what happens to the dog there? And so, you know, I wanted to share that story uh, with all of you out there. So it's a very common bias for people to have, but I really want people to understand if you can't do something without the dog, you can't do it with the dog. I will spot check people in our training group and I will say, okay, now go walk it. You know, show, show me what you're going to do. They go and they're like, oh, okay. Cause they were ready to go and get their dog, right? They're like, oh, they give you the exasperated sigh and then they go and walk in and oh, yep. Cause I'd been watching them walk it. They're stuck. Oh, they just forgot it right there. And they pause for a second. They look around and then they remember what comes next. And then they come in the finish and they're going to go get their dog and say, nope, I saw that. <laughs> do it again and do it again and do it again until it's fluid, until they're not pausing and looking around in that spot. If you're pausing and looking around in that spot without the dog, you're definitely going to do it with the dog and you are going to have a mistake there. It's that simple. So there's so much you can do in terms of mechanics. I listened to a great talk years and years ago from Greg Derrett on reinforcement. And what he, what he was talking about was reinforcing your dog with food. And he took a handful of kibble, put it in one hand. And while he was talking, just almost absentmindedly, without even looking, just took one treat out, 
grabbed it and put it down on the table and another and another and another and very quickly, fluidly, without spilling any treats, without dropping any treats, without grabbing two treats, anything like that. And his point was that this is a mechanical skill. You have to practice it because you want to deliver the treats to your dog as quickly as possible in the shortest amount of time to keep the reinforcement rate really, really high. And he said, this is something that you should practice uh, before you actually try it. Well, oh. Here we're talking about practicing picking up a piece of kibble out of your hand and putting it on a table How over many, and over. <laughs> let, let me ask you this. How many people sitting there in that seminar do you think went home and grabbed a handful of food, picked it up and did that and just put food on the table? I'm thinking zero. <laughs> no one wants to do that. But when you're doing that, that is just free work and free practice. So when you go and you start working with your dog, you're not dropping treats all over the floor. Your dog is not jumping up on top of you trying to get those treats because you've already smoothly delivered it to your dog. So these can be very beneficial to your dog just having this practice. All right. Now we've talked about all the great things, told you how to do it. There is a con. There's a bit, there's a, in fact, a very big con and it's actually caused, it's a problem caused by muscle memory. This, this process that we're talking about. And it's that once you've learned something and it's become muscle memory and then you want to change it. Well, it's like what you were saying with the end of the year. You, the, the 2016 exactly. has become muscle memory. The exactly. 2017 has so not. Basically, it's going to take longer to change and it's going to take more practice to change than if you had never learned it in the first place. That's right. That's a trade-off that I'll make, though, because I'm going to concentrate on making the things muscle memory that I want to do. Absolutely. But, but, but one but, place where we've seen this recently is we've been doing these um, these Facebook Live sessions where we, we're live in front of a camera talk, talking about a topic in agility, and we like to have a demo, and it's live, right? That's kind of scary in and of itself, live demo. You never know what's going to happen. But we like to show – a problem and a solution, yes. right? And uh, sometimes the problem is caused by handling something and, you know, for instance, front cross, not having great front cross footwork, right? Now, when we try to demo this, it's it's the exact opposite of the newcomer to agility who has to think so hard about the front cross. We have to think really hard about not doing it right, because doing it right has become muscle memory. It's actually very difficult to simulate making a mistake when you've internalized doing it correctly. Mm -hmm. So it's really kind of uh, reminded me of that whole process and kind of in reverse. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a that's an interesting point, and it's true. Well, you know why why is this even worth mentioning? You know, it seems kind of self evident. Well, because there's a lot of people who've been in agility and had a lot of uh, relative success, you know, championship titles, appearances and finals and things like that. And they've been doing agil agility or a certain brand of agility or a certain brand of handling style or a certain method of, of training a particular obstacle or training dogs in general. And, you know, once they're in that and something comes along that's better or there is some kind of room for self-improvement, one of the reasons that they're not going to is because whether it's conscious or unconscious, they – understand that it takes quite a bit to unlearn things that have become muscle memory. And so in this way, all the beginners out there listening, you are at an advantage. You know, it's your first dog or your second dog, but it's your first serious agility dog because you really haven't learned all those things. And even if you have, even if you've been doing it for like a year, that's nothing compared to somebody who's been doing it 10, 15, 20 years. They have thousands, 10,000 uh, repetitions behind them of doing front crosses a certain way, rewarding a dog a certain way, throwing a toy at a specific time. And if someone says, well, you know, maybe there's a better way you can do that. And they try it a couple of times. It's going to feel wrong. They're going to do it poorly and they're not going to want to continue. And you as the kind of the newbie, you're not going to run into that. And so that is a huge advantage that you have. And in this day and era, uh, social media, the internet, Information passes so quickly, people learn so quickly that things that took me 10 years to figure out, you guys are learning in your first couple months in agility. Or as soon as you listen to this podcast, or you watch a video, or you watch another trainer's video, or you watch your friend post a sequence from practice and you pick up on something that you really like. Information is transmitted so quickly. And I want all of you to really capitalize on that. 
and uh, not be afraid of that, but just understand how this muscle memory kind of comes into play and how for the experienced people listening, um, it can kind of hold you back without you being aware. So ask yourself, you know, is this something that's holding me back? Because I know it's going to be difficult to unlearn this. And it's, and also it's going to be confusing for my dog. It's like when you first teach a dog backsides, it's not a big deal if they're a puppy. But if they're a nine-year veteran of the American Kennel Club and they've never seen a backside on a course before in their lives, it is very hard to teach them a backside. One last thing that uh, I wanted to talk about with muscle memory kind of just occurred to me is that – there's a kind of an interesting phenomenon that happens with muscle memory where you are not always conscious of every single aspect of what you do as a handler on course. And this is super important when you are an instructor because there are things that you're doing that you have incorporated uh, subtle shifts in in your body position or your a weight shift that you have that help you execute something better. And when people ask you the question, uh, you may actually have to get out in front of a jump and go through the motions to pinpoint, you know, what exactly you're doing every step of the way. And that's why I think that video review and the skill of video review as both an instructor and as a student of the game, the ability to watch video and, and, uh, see what's happening is really important because even students can sometimes pick out these little nuanced things that you're doing and learn from them. And then you can take that and now it bring it into your more conscious thought process for teaching, you know, the next student or the next seminar or, or anything like that. So I think that's a, a little corollary there to muscle memory. Oh, that's a really great point. And this happens at all levels of sports. You have great athletes that are truly great and don't even realize what they're doing that makes them great. And then you have people who are very good at the analysis and understanding the observation. They break things down. They watch film in slow motion and they're able to teach other people, even though they themselves are not a great athlete. So a lot of these fantastic NBA coaches who win a lot of titles or soccer coaches, et cetera. Yes. A lot of them are former players. Some of them never played at that level or played professionally, and yet they're at the very top of their game in terms of coaching. And so definitely for your instructors out there, I think that's a valuable uh, tip here that Sarah's giving you. All right. Well, that's it for this week's podcast. I think there's a lot of exciting stuff in there for instructors and competitors, but especially those new to agility. I really want you to take to heart uh, what we're saying here and know that you can also become fluid over time with practice. We'd like to thank our sponsors, Elite Science and Back on Track, and also NTI Global. Tunnel bags and accessories. Keep your agility gear in place with these NTI agility items. Endless combinations of colors to pick from that match your vibrant tunnels. Visit shop.ntiglobal.com for the widest selection of dog agility tunnels for both competition and backyard training. Known for free shipping, more options, high quality products, and low prices, NTI Global has got you covered. Also offering tamer and anchor weight bags, along with a full line of accessories and agility storage solutions. Need your agility gear in a hurry? Don't forget to check the in-stock selection. Visit shop.ntiglobal.com and use promo code TAMER2017 for 5% off savings today. Promo code good through April 30th, 2017. Happy training! Happy training!